Welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to the podcast. And our sponsor this week is the JAEC Foundation, which is hosting an international conference on open dialogue this August. And you can visit the website jaecfoundation.org for more information. And now on to our interview. Hello and welcome to the podcast. And this week we are really pleased to be announcing the launch of a new global affiliated site, which is Madden Island. Madden Island launches on August the 22nd and joins our other global sites, which include Madden the UK, Madden Canada, Madden Finland and Madden Brazil, amongst others. Joining me to discuss the launch and the important role that Madden Island will play are Liam McGowan, Martha Griffin, Elaine Brown and Harry Geibels, who are part of a team that has been working hard to get Madden Island up and running. Before we hear from them, you can also help us to get Madden Island up and running. So please do go and visit the sites, which can be found online at maddenisland.com. And when you visit, please share the site also on social media and with friends and colleagues. And please support Madden Island as it grows and develops. Okay, um, welcome all. Thank you so much for joining me today for the Madden America podcast. And um, we're, it's very exciting. We're here today to talk about the launch of Madden Island, which is uh, not too far away now. And, and um, this is going to be a new of our global sites affiliated with Madden America. Um, we'll come on uh, to talk a little bit about the site, but I, I wondered first if you could each briefly introduce yourselves and maybe say a few words about how you came to be involved in the project to launch Madden Island. My name is uh, Harry Geibels, and um, thanks, James, for organizing this this podcast uh, for Mad, Madden America in advance of the launch of Madden Island. It's been a long time coming, and glad to see it's uh, come to fruition now in the next few weeks. Um, I'm a retired uh, mental health nurse professional, uh, but I've worked in uh, mental health edu- mental health nursing education for many years in University College Cork in Ireland, um, and have been uh, sort of have a critical position really since I became a mental health nurse myself many many years ago. Soon began to wonder what this is all about. Um, so I've had to shed a lot of knowledge and gained a lot of more valuable knowledge over the years, uh, which. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, was much more valuable in working with people in, in, in distress. Um, my interest in, uh, in Man and Ireland stems back from quite a few years. I'm involved in various different, uh, well, I have been and still involved in various different projects in Ireland. Uh, the main one is the Critical Voices Network Ireland, uh, together with Lydia Sapuna. Uh, we, keep that, we keep that going for the last uh, 14 years. I've also I'm very active in the Hearing Voices Network Ireland, which was launched about uh, in 2015, if, if my memory serves me right. And I've also been involved, uh, have been involved in setting up an alternative uh, type of project, which is Sliella, uh, called the Social Farm, uh, to support people in, in distress or in their recovery. So those are the three main areas of my involvement. And uh, one of the things that uh, sort of led to setting up the Mad in, Mad in Ireland is uh, the presence uh, of, of Bob Whitaker some years ago when he did a lecture tour, uh, which was organized by the CVNI, Mad, uh, and Freedom, Freedom Island, and various other people and organizations. And then Bob came back a couple of years, some years ago, uh, at the Cork, uh, at the annual Cork. Critical Voices Network Island Conference. And I think the discussion started there again in setting it up. And here we are a few years later, it's coming to fruition. So that's a little bit about uh, about myself and uh, and also a little bit about Lydia Sapuna because we're working closely together on the Critical Voices Network Island. So my name is Elaine, Elaine Brown, and I'm delighted to be part of this um, I suppose my background is I was originally trained to be a counsellor and I, I saw uh, an advertisement in the local newspaper for, I was in going into my third year of counselling, saw the advertisement in the newsletter that you could train to be a mental health peer support worker. 
and be open about your mental health to help others on their journey. And immediately um, I was like, yes, I got the application in and trained through Liam McGowan and Paddy McGowan. And shortly afterwards, quit the counselling and did some amazing training. Um, yes, I suppose I'm described as a psychiatric survivor. Um, I would have arrived at the training with what I didn't know at the time was a, a lot of internalised stigma. And a lot of people who go through the services, I'm learning through the years, you know, like myself would have come out of the services feeling a lot of guilt and shame and that was a long recovery road rather than the recovery road from my mental health really so I was recovering from the services a lot. I worked within the services as a mental health peer support worker until 2016. 2017 I started my own practice I suppose as a mental health peer support worker within the community and started having peer support groups in my living room, which is behind me here. Um, started meeting people, I suppose, on park benches. Uh, coffee shops weren't always, <laughs> um, you know, started a Facebook page then in 2018. And then it all started happening, had to find premises. Um, through DCU, I would have been part of setting up the Hearing Voices group here in uh, Casabar in County Mayo in the west of Ireland and officially started a prospective mental health peer support centre in Clare Morris in 2019. Um, a lot of what happens at Perspective is very much um, a constant dialogue in the community about mental health it's very much intentional peer support and there would be a lot of peer support. There would be two peer support groups as well that would happen during the week. Um, I would also work with children um, in terms because my mental health really would have started when I was in fifth and sixth class. So I would work with children in a very well-being focused kind of way. Um, a lot of the people who have come to Perspective. There are two people now who are going this year who have, there's a couple of people who have gone through DCU and trained as peer support workers. And there's one this year who has just completed the Sherry Mead training in intentional peer support. So there's no, there's no kind of intentional plan <laughs> with what I'm doing in the whole focus of peer support. I'm just kind of taking the next right step and the next right step and just enjoying it all. But definitely doing the training back in 2011 for me was a game changer. Yeah, my, my name is um, Lee McGowan and I'm uh, a mixture of things. I suppose I'm a, I'm a lecturer, I'm a, a researcher and uh, a mental health practitioner uh, would be kind of, would, would kind of wrap it up. Um, uh, most of my work, which would draw me to to here, to Mad in America, has always centered around uh, alternatives and trying to question and, uh, I suppose, change the status quo, not just for the sake of it, but it's what the call is from people with experience, from radical professionals, I suppose from anybody who's looking at alternative evidence to the biocentric model of mental illness. So for Quite a long time I was drawn to that. Very quickly, I, I kind of was spawned in some of the radical movements in England in the kind of late 80s, early 90s, and came back to Ireland with some of those ideas uh, and had the opportunity because I was invited into academia, which at the time was a place where you could maybe get involved in changing practice. So very early on, I was able to get involved in practice that was cutting edge and educational programs that were cutting edge and collaborating with the survivor service movement from the outset which was which was i suppose key to uh, and is key to everything i've done since um in terms of mad in in, in ireland so 
a lot of, a lot of my, my work, and Elaine referred to Paddy McGowan earlier. Right? Paddy McGowan would have, I suppose, been responsible for starting the service user movement in Ireland, uh, at least, or at least the the visible service user movement. So for a long time, we were nationally and internationally kind of looking and kind of challenging alternatives and, and both would have been part of an international movement which brought us in touch with Madden America, the international network towards alternatives to recovery. <clears throat> Uh, since then changed to the international network uh, towards uh, rights-based approaches. Um, but that brought us in kind of in connection with the new paradigm kind of development that Madden America kind of talks about, trying to shift the biocentric paradigm towards a paradigm which, which, which in fairness is accepted by uh, the World Health Organization, by the United Nations, by various reports and, and by government policies where, where it's really... It's really at the kind of regional, local levels that that paradigm is, you know, that cultural shift is not happening. So there was a synergy with MAD in America, in Tar and the likes, and, and, and our, I suppose, philosophy. And several conversations with Bob over the years, including at, 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 at CVNI that, that, that uh, Harry talked about, um, it just seemed right because there, there was a surge of survivor recognition in Ireland up until about maybe five years ago, and there was quite a lot of strong push to inter- to bring them to bring them into the voice and the development of, of of statutory services. But then there was kind of what I would kind of consider, and this is personal, um, co opt co opting of of what was a really strong survivor service user position, and it's happened elsewhere all over the world. And the voice began to sink and sink and sink and mainstream media only carries one voice it only carries the kind of biocentric voice so for me um, what was the final kind of push for Madden Ireland was that kind of oh god here we go back down into another cycle of the voice being suppressed again socially kind of media wise and that's where you know the conversation in, in the restaurant down in Cork there, Steve and I was kind of uh, we were sitting around the table and said, right, it's time we have to do it. So that's kind of where where I'm coming from. So it is about giving voice to the, the, to, to the new paradigm uh, on mainstream. Great. Thanks, James. Um, my name is Martha Griffin and um, currently I'm working as an expert by experience in DCU. Um, I, I suppose I had my own experience of mental health before I ever worked in the area. Um, and I suppose what I learned from that was that um, it never got to root cause or it never kind of um, it, it didn't kind of match what I was feeling on the inside it was lovely to get labelled and it was lovely to think that you know something that I experienced you know was being taken seriously because it was all inside me rather than outside but it didn't go any further than that and I suppose where I got most of my learning um, was when I joined, uh, after I trained as a community development worker, I worked in the Gateway Mental Health Project in Rock Mines and I worked with lots of people who had mental health issues. And I suppose when I walked in the door, I said, why didn't I know this was here before that? Um, and it was there that I started having conversations with people um, and you'd hear people's stories. And, you know, it, I knew very early on that you know there was no kind of science proper science to say you know it was brain or it was whichever and there was no quick solutions and when you hear of people's you know stories of loss or hurt or pain um i suppose that resonated better with me um so i worked in the Gateway project for seven years and then i finished up there and I um, ended up in DCU, which I love at the moment. Um, it's great uh, working in the Dublin North North East Recovery College as well. And I suppose sometimes Alima and myself will probably have these conversations. Going, are we doing the wrong thing? You know, or and we have to reflect because the world outside looks, I suppose, different. And you'll read some good papers and you'll say, oh, you know, that that sounds you know, but the feeling of, of even accessing services again, I had to do it recently. Um, you know, you're kind of going, well, no, actually, that doesn't ring true. So I suppose there's a truth and there's a kind of a veneer PR piece as well that's out there. And I suppose I want to kind of bring the truth into the light as much as possible. So that's kind of why I'm drawn to Madden Ireland. 
Thank you all. Thank you all for int- introducing yourselves. So you, you, you all kind of touched on it in different ways, but I wondered if you had thoughts about, you know, the, the, the context behind, you know, how mental health care is approached in Ireland. And, you know, some of you alluded to, you know, a bio, bio model. So, you know, I, I just wanted, for, you know, ask for your thoughts on, you know, how things are now in Ireland and maybe what um, Madden Ireland could do differently. And Let's uh, see if I can reflect on that particular question. I retired from uh, from uh, UCC uh, five years ago as a mental health nursing educator. I'm still ac- I'm still very active, but I find it very difficult now to get a sense of what's happening in Ireland, being being away almost from it. So if you look at the media, as Liam was saying, you know you only get one perspective. It's very difficult. I happen to know a lot of stuff because I have many networks and contacts. But I can imagine that for the uh, sort of the average person in in the country. It's very difficult to to know what's going on, apart from the uh, the usual traditional uh, way of thinking, because of the, the information is lacking. So I hope that uh, Men in Ireland can make can make a uh, make a position there and and maybe um, share with share different ways of of, of thinking and, and working and uh, uh, maybe by doing that we can generate some some changes. Because we've all, we're all working very hard, in a sense, individually or in small groups right across the country. There are so many people doing so many good work, such good work. And that, in a sense, is how we started the Critical Forces Network Island all those years ago, is to try and bring uh, people together and try and do something. Um, and you know, to some extent, we, we succeeded a little bit at, at, around that time, but it sort of faded away again. So I think, you know, if we can bring all those diverse groups, individuals back together under one roof, we may be getting somewhere um, in the course of time. I'm not that uh, optimistic about it because the power of psychiatry and the power of of Big Pharma is very, very strong indeed. Uh, But I think, yes, um, and and, and to be part of an international movement as well, that's that's, that's very, very important. And and, and it's good to see that Mad in America is moving to Mad in the world, so a global network uh, would help us as well in Ireland. Thank you, Harry. That that discoverability of alternatives is, is so important, isn't it? And uh, any thoughts from the rest of you about that, about how mental health care is in Ireland now and what Madden Ireland can do differently? Yeah, I suppose if I can answer from a peer support worker point of view it, within the community, and year, I'm in year three, I suppose, within the community. And I feel that what I'm noticing that what's common to perspective is ordinarily people would go to the doctor for and expect a sort of a quick fix or uh, a cure, you know, and they're almost in the mindset of like, you know, if I take this pill, that this will cure it or that they would go to the services, you know, in times of crisis for for things really, when you sit down and talk about them and de-escalate a situation is grief, loss, you know, uh, long periods of low mood, lack of meaning, lack of purpose. Um, and, you know, there's no pill that will cure that. But I suppose from my point of view, people are still in that mindset of, oh my gosh, I don't know how I'm feeling or what's going on for me. So I have to go to the only service that is available. And that is sort of the medical model of care. But really, like as Martha mentioned earlier, like the root cause is really something, is really something else. And it's, you know, people can feel like they're they're going mad and I don't know. And in those moments, they don't know what to do other than go to a service that is highlighted for mental health. But really, The way that I'm trained as a peer support worker is that like mental health is a human response to life events and to life itself and and the interior response to to life events. And there's no pills that can cure that. So I suppose for me, MAD in Ireland would very much be widening. And I can see a change at perspective in year three. People are beginning to see that there isn't a pill that cures this stuff. And I suppose the, the chemical imbalance theory was thrown out I think in the 1980s was it or I I would hope that MAD in Ireland would open that up to seeing that like these are human issues these are human responses to life events and there isn't a pill 
that can cure it, that, that, that you have choice, you know, if we really de-escalate the situation, you have the answers within you to find the solution. Um, and the person, I suppose, through someone else's opinion or doctrination is not the way forward. And it's the same as myself. I got locked in in that kind of model and it didn't serve me. And unfortunately, it's heartbreaking for me to see all the time, the pe- all the time, the people who get locked in that sort of doctrine. And, you know, for me, it took a long time to come off medications like Effexor, lithium, stuff like that, because they're heavy duty drugs, you know, and I feel there is a way forward. I'm not anti-medication, but I feel there is a way forward for people to have something different, to have um, choice, to have choice and alternatives and, you know, to be able to have a menu, if you like, of stuff that's out there um, because there are amazing people doing amazing work and what works for me doesn't work for somebody else and vice versa, but to have choice. So that would be that would be my hope. And I suppose the mental health services in Ireland at the moment, there's there's no menu. <laughs> There's there's nothing out there. Um, you know, there's only kind of a one stop kind of shop, really. I suppose for me, um, while I if I think about Mad in Ireland, what Mad in Ireland can do, we we there's two things happening. There, there's no doubt that there's a very slow attempt by services through well meaning people, through policy change to try and change the status quo. But as Elaine said, there's no menu. We've got an infrastructure that's just not recovery orientated. So part of the challenge for people who actually want that system to change is how can we do it within an unchangeable infrastructure? Um, Like some of us, and, and probably everybody here on the call, we're so used to knowing people and ways of working alternatively that it's very easy to forget that the majority of people think there's only one way and 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 that's the only choice they have. You know, I I I keep having to remind myself of that. And 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 as Harry was pointing to earlier on, um, mainstream media sells that no menu approach. There's mental illness. There's no menu approach. And we have a really strong biocentric um, kind of professional stance at the moment. And it's a it's a, it's a resistance. A resistance to an actual beginning of a paradigm shift you can see it you know the, the, the stronger the biocentric because of the the other stuff so and I, and I know of good practices in services i know of people uh, and i've been part of part of that movement with them in services doing open dialogue doing trauma-informed care work you know uh, one of one of one of the services we're going to showcase at the launch 49 north street has turned to a, what traditionally be called a day hospital into a completely different kind of you know um uh, place for people to go to so there is the possibility because uh, unfortunately you know probably 90 percent of people have to use statutory mental health services so what i'm hoping is that um Madden Ireland can showcase um, the other story, um, the other paradigm that can work wherever. And it's not only a paradigm for the kind of the the people who can afford it, uh, for the people who live the alternative lives. That it's a paradigm to professionals working in the services can also see, Jesus, I, I, I could do that. I could do that where I work in the community mental health team, or I could do that. So I, I, I see there's something that's going to influence part of that cultural shift on the inside as much as on the outside. But if you're only seeing constantly this biomedical, and if you're constantly, you know, fighting against, you know, even as a professional assistant that just seems to suppress you uh, and you can't see any way out, um, I see Mad in Ireland as a kind of a lens for a way out and a way of shifting that shifting that culture and and yes yeah, showcasing good practice in and outside of of, of of um services that's that's kind of my what i think we can how we can change it you know we've we've been doing pushing alternative pushing cutting edge bringing in and trying to do stuff and successfully you know in several areas through the critical voices for example the hearing voices for example some of the kind of radical courses like peer support is kind of on everybody's lips now for example you know um back when elaine when Lane did the course. It was some sort of EBGB thing that people were talking about. Um, so th- then things are happening. So this is now a lens for that to be seen. 
because it's, it's not being seen outside of the people that know about it if you know what i mean but it just gives an opportunity that's that's my hope anyway for and, and that's what i'm you know aspiring for for it I suppose I'm kind of focused on the mental health amendment bill that's coming through in Ireland um, at the moment. And there was kind of hope that it would change and be in line with UNCRPD. And it's been put off until the autumn now. Um, And there's been many, and I know Harry, you were part of this as well, many kind of presentations before the committee on um, mental health. And there was conversations heard by senators, I suppose, that they hadn't heard before. Um, But there's still a kind of uh, nervousness around... um, giving full rights to people with mental health issues in Ireland. So I suppose that's the kind of backdrop for societal change that needs to be pushed on. Um, And there's some powerful people in Ireland working on it. And I suppose maybe this can be a platform as well for them to, I suppose, let people or the lay people know what the legislation says in Ireland about people with mental health issues. Um, So I, I kind of think that's important. Um, thank you. Though. Well, that's really helpful. So if we can turn to the site itself a little bit. So, you know, I have to say, you know, all of us at Madden America are really excited and, and thrilled to see you get underway. And, you know, we, we know that, you know, we know from the other global affiliates that there are so many important roles for a site like yours to have in terms of sharing survivor stories and, you know, as you say, sharing, connecting people with experiences outside the kind of traditional system. So, you know, I, I just wondered, um, what your thoughts were on, you know, what kind of content Madden Island is going to have and what your plans are after the launch, you know, to, to kind of develop it as it goes forward. I think the message was once you kind of people know what it is you're trying to do, um, which is what we're aiming for the launch, um, with some samples of that, like exactly what you said, survivor stories, examples of good practice, stuff that's globally relevant so there's that section there of globally relevant stuff from mad in america that would be just as relevant to ireland at least in our view so so for me it's i'm i'm trusting what you're saying is that um build it and they will come um so um so we want to be strong about our kind of guide or submission guidelines we have quite a good representative uh, you know editing committee so that when people come in, and we know because because we're all connected to so many networks, we know that people will be screaming to get stuff up there, and it'll probably be a challenge to hold it back. I think in, in, um, in one way. So for me, it's um, is to try and maintain, uh, I suppose, our vision and our principles from the outset, um, and to kind of um, almost to have a, a regular reflective process for ourselves so that we don't get stuck in oh that's good that's good that's good you know so we keep that kind of critical edge so we keep to our to, you know to the notion of this is an alternative um you know this is this is allowing an alternative to 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 um regular media and i'm also aware that when this is launched that there will be an approaches from contemporary media to try and kind of link into what's happening. So there'll almost be an attempt by by kind of the standard media to take some of this, you know, and kind of say, oh, this could be good for us as well. So just want to be want to be very reflective and kind of present to after the launch, uh, you know, what response might be. And obviously, we'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll in our own lives, some of us will probably get some fallout as well, um, and, and that's fine. We're all we're all comfortable with that uh, or at least uncomfortably accepting of it uh, so yeah th- that's as far as i can I-, I can think to just hold true to the values and and the launch will, will will be an example yeah and i think it's timely as well because you know it's been a while since we've had a kind of movement in ireland and podcasting and internet is a new kind of way of of kind of getting people and I remember you know looking up forums in 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 my day kind of getting them trying to get for information whereas people are more used to going to podcasts and I think it will take off quite quickly um you know people are looking for answers and alternatives and difference and connecting in um so it's very exciting I'm looking forward to seeing the Irish flavor coming out through um the website and the, the podcast as well because it's it's lovely to listen to Madden UK and Madden America, but, you know, it'll be good to hear all the, the different voices as well from around the country. Yeah, I suppose for me, in a cultural context, I think we as Irish people, we're really good at secrets and we're really good at sort of <laughs> putting things into the cupboard and not saying anything about it. And that would be a lot of our sort of cultural background of mental health, do you know? So like that was the great side of me training as a peer support worker 
in 2011 that I could come out of the closet, you know, and that I could voice when I met my peers the first day it was like I felt like I was coming home I could voice you know what was happening for me and I think for me the content as a peer support worker is very much about normalizing these experiences because as a peer I don't see them as illnesses you know the people who come to perspective and the people I have met on my journey are not ill they're experiencing extraordinary experiences you know internally to life or to life events you know people have voices and visions as well that are that are part of their makeup and who they are it doesn't always you know mean that they're ill you know sometimes these can be an enhancement to life I feel you know and they make the world more colorful I've definitely met amazing people like to to my life and work as a peer support worker so I feel that the content you know normalizing mental health and i i hate even calling it mental health normalizing being human we've had three suicides here in the last month so you know i want mad in ireland for those people who didn't make it you know so i i want it so much and i feel guilt every time somebody doesn't make it and i want the content to be for the people who before crisis are are feeling a, a bit sort of what's wrong with me? You know, am I going mad? You know, what am I experiencing? Who do I talk to? Where do I go? So I want them, you know, to talk to people who, as Liam said, used to have mental health, you know, who've done the journey, who've done the road and who hear about other therapies and other things that are out there um, without it escalating and without it coming to crisis point. So yeah, I would hope that, um, the content would be very much based around e- the evolvement of of the person as being human rather as being ill and unwell. Yeah. Like Liam, uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how this how this side develops over time. I don't think we have any idea at the moment. Uh, uh, we you now we're talking about control in the sense we are in control. We we do control what goes on and what doesn't go on. So in a sense, we are, yeah, we we are control, we are controlling that. Be interesting to see how the media responds to it, or how we respond to the media, and vice versa. You know, what do we do to engage with the media uh, after the launch? You know, do we wait for a while and see how how things develop before we maybe approach the media and say, you know, here we are, take note. Uh, no doubt, twit- the, the, the Twitter account will be very very important. That we've talked about it uh, at, our, at our recent meetings as well. So. Then there'll be an important feature of it, but also, uh, you know, what will the site hold? And we've talked about that. Will it be a suppository of information? Will we have particular, specific uh, themes that we want to focus on over a period of time? Marta referred to the to the mental health, uh, the new the, the new bill, uh, that might become a theme for a while, uh, just to focus on on aspects, on things that are happening in Ireland. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about all the different uh, national um, uh, mad, mad in uh, mad in the world uh, affiliates. Now they all have their own their own uh, ways of working as well. They focus on different aspects. Now thinking about the ones in in, in the Netherlands, focusing very much on ph- psychopharmacology. I think so. There are different affiliates who focus on different things. Uh, they share a lot of things, but also have. Um, have have their own their own um, focus, and I like uh, as Aileen just said, you know that we have to we have to try and sell the Irish one, and also conscious that we are of course representing the island of Ireland, uh, all the corners of the island in a sense, and we hope certainly that we get we get people from the north uh, the northern parts of the island. On board as well uh, in in influencing and working working on the side. Uh, absolutely, and in terms of people, you know, listening to this, I mean, firstly, you know, I don't think it's really, I don't think people know how much work and effort goes into launching a site like this, and you know how how much of a labour of love it is. So, you know, I'm really grateful to you all for you know everything you're doing to pull this together, and and really in terms of listeners, you know, they can really help by publicising what Madden Island is doing, and it's it's you know. Its presence and you know 
I think you said yourself that, you know, the nice thing about the affiliate sites is they can take really interesting international work and apply a local lens and a local flavor to it and make it meaningful for the people of Ireland who are desperately seeking an alternative to perhaps a very difficult situation they might find themselves in. So, you know, certainly listeners, you know, encourage you to visit the site and to read the articles and to, you know, promote the site on your social media and share it with friends and, and that kind of stuff. That's hugely important to the the life and survivability of these sites, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's necessary as well if we want to <clears throat> push, I suppose, what's coming down the line over the line. Because, I mean, it, it really kind of sets the tone for the policy and, you know, practice in mental health services as well as outside. Um, definitely. There's been a, a few groups and there's been a few kind of worrying kind of developments in Ireland recently where NGOs are attending conferences that are supported by pharmaceuticals and you know, people more kind of leaning into the mental illness language rather than mental health because, you know, they're saying, well, some people who suffer from mental health, it's different. You know, there's a, there's a small cohort over here who won't recover and who won't do well. And so there's a kind of a div- division or a kind of a, you know, keeping um, and, and disabling a whole group of people um, based on, I suppose, old ideas. Um, and even when we have our policy, you know, we draw up new policies. We don't have a, you know, let's think and bring in the latest kind of scientific evidence for it. It's more like, well, this is the structure we have. Where do we go from here? Um, there isn't a reinventing at all. Um, and I suppose I'm particularly worried about kind of, you know, young people in Ireland. Um, I always think of my kids and them accessing, you know, services and what that would look like or what would happen if they needed support for their mental health. And I would say currently, and, and a lot of people who work in mental health services would say the same thing, they wouldn't send relatives in. Um, and we see kind of Cork Kerry where young people are lactating because of the amount of drugs they're on and, you know, no clinical oversight um, happening in some areas. So I think if the legislation backdrop was strong and the UNCRPD and um, the um, capacity legislation and supports around decision making, all of that would make a huge kind of change on people being kind of able to uh, demand their rights rather than, you know, there's no right to service in Ireland. Um, that's very lacking. Um, so it's kind of, you know, oh, we don't have money. It's not in your area. It's a postcode lottery. So a lot of that would change if the legislation kind of was pushed forward. So I think it's a good lens to look from. You reminded me there as well, and it's come up in the conversations, and it comes up in a lot of global affiliate conversations, um, the need to also provide strong evidence. Now, a much broader evidence than kind of a, a kind of a, a pharmacological chemical evidence for, for most of the biocentric stuff, but a broad evidence so that the the, the old paradigm kind of uh, gang don't use the standard kind of where's the evidence, where's the evidence, where's the evidence. So. We know there's more evidence backing up alternatives than there is backing up the uh, the, the originals. So, um, uh, but I think I'd like to make sure we kind of keep that there, so that when people are making arguments, they have evidence uh, at least as the old paradigm understands it, as society understands it, to back up what it is they're saying and doing. Yeah, if if I can add just just quickly, I suppose just going back to the human rights issue just for a minute. Um, with the human rights issue, I suppose, for me, is confidentiality and a human rights issue of, you know, having having choice rather and for the person's pain to be witnessed and acknowledged rather than to be observed, you know. And there are, you know, alternatives out there that that pain can be witnessed and, uh, and acknowledged, you know, confidentially without it going to part of a bigger team and for it to be observed, you know, I mean, for for my pain and my peers' pain to be observed is very, um, I can't even put a word to it. Do you know, I mean, I requested my files from the psychiatric services and it was observed. I was having a relationship with another patient, which was not happening. I suppose in, in all of that time that I was there, it, it was never asked, well, what do you think? How are you? You know, I, I was told how I was rather than and that's what I want for people. And that's a human rights issue, you know, as far as I'm concerned. 
And I suppose the other thing is as well is, you know, because I would be asked to go into schools and stuff. And what I witness in schools is that like people are told, children are are told about illnesses. So they're so so they're given the names of like depression, schizophrenia, bipolar, you know, and that's not that's that's not what I want for my child, my 16 year old or my friend's kids or or any child. Yeah, it's conditioning, isn't it? It's conditioning. So they're they're already put into this mindset of sort of illness. And if you get ill, this is what you do and this is where you go, you know. And I, I want something different. I want for for people that they hear that like, you know, human distress is normal and, you know, for it to be acknowledged and witnessed in confidential environments is part of the sort of overcoming and healing and recovery journey of it all. And I think people have a right to that information, you know, and I don't want us to be sort of like us against them. I, I would like you know, sort of a more of a, an amalgamation of sort of an awakening, if you like, that people see that like, you know, this this is not working. So we need to sort of look at, at a bigger picture, a, a more authentic, honest picture of the reality of what it's like to be human now on this day in 2022, you know, and and not from an illness perspective, from a uh, a loving and humanitarian and dignified perspective. Thank you all so much for taking the time to join me today and to share really, really exciting details about Madden Island. You know, that, that there is such an appetite for all that you're going to do and so many people will feel empowered and touched and reached and connected with it. And, you know, we, we know from other affiliate sites that while it's a lot of work, it's just hugely, hugely valuable and beneficial. So it's been fantastic to talk to you all about it today. Thanks, James. And likewise. Thank you so much, James. Thanks. Margaret. Well, I just want to thank Liam, Martha, Elena and Harry for joining me today. As a reminder, you can visit the site at maddenisland.com and you can support them as they get up and running by visiting regularly and sharing the site far and wide. Thank you so much for listening today, and until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.